the uh, evening services we'll be having the back to school ice cream night with hot dogs and ice cream and after the evening services the young ones will meet up front and they're going to have a little devotion uh, and have some give out some things to you so every one of you hope you'll get to come tonight and be at Enjoy the fellowship being with each and every one of us. Uh, also, it's in the bulletin. If anyone would like to teach <clears throat> as far as the classes, let Dennis know. He said we need all the help we can get right now. So if anybody is willing to teach, please let him know. Uh, in our worship today, <clears throat> our song leader will be Joel Foster. Our scripture reading, Ray Moore. Our lesson by Dennis Strine and our closing prayer by Rusty, <laughs> Rusty Maddox. And we'll begin our worship service with open prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Our most kind, lovely Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have that we can come out and be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We can study thy word, sing praises unto you, <clears throat> come to you in communion with you, give back unto you, come to you <clears throat> in prayer. Thank you for each and everything that you've done for us and we can ask for things that we need at this time. We thank you for your son Jesus as he come to this earth. He lived and died as a man. Set an example for each and every one of us. Left his word so we could have that we could study. We can apply it to our lives. Do what it says. Teach others our word. And hope at the end of our time we can all have a home with thee in heaven. I also thank you for our health and our strength that enables us to be here. Thank you for each one of our members. Thank you for the church here at Malden. We pray that each and everything we say and do here always will be according to thy will. Pray at this time that you'll be with our brother Joel as he leads our singing, that all of us will lift up our voices of praise unto you. Be with brother Dennis. <coughs> Vicky as they work here with us. Pray with Dennis as he has a ready recollection of things he studied. <clears throat> I pray that each one of us will listen attentively this morning. We can take these things that we <clears throat> that he teaches unto us. We can study and apply it to our lives. And pray each one of us can go out and teach other, teach our others, teach our neighbors, teach our co-workers thy word. <clears throat> I also pray at this time that you be with the ones of our members, all of our shut-ins, be the ones that are sick, be with the ones that take care of them, doctors, nurses, and their families. <clears throat> I also pray that you'll be with our military, especially the ones on foreign souls. Pray that you'll be with Brian at this time. Pray that you'll be, <clears throat> keep him safe and return him back to his family. Be with all the ones that's on foreign souls and keep them safe also. I pray at this time that you'll be with all the first responders, that you'll keep them safe as they protect us. Also be with our leaders of our nations. I pray that they would look unto you for guidance before they want to do uh, make law, make things that's not according to thy will. I also pray that you'll be with us, that you'll always guard, guide, direct us, and forgive us for all our many sins. I stand and pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Morning. Seven zero five. Seven zero five. Seven zero five. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known the wicked oppressed. And now see he's from distressing. Sing praises to his name. He forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fall and we were winning, Lord, thy. Be all the glory. 
Supper. 916. 916. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. sacrifice that our Savior made for us. He instituted this in order that we would be able to do this the first day of each week. It was important for Jesus to do this to fulfill all scripture, but also to be in obedience to the old law. We understand where this all got started, the Passover feast, in the land of Egypt. That feast saved the firstborn. This feast designed to save the world and we remember that sacrifice. In Mark, the 14th chapter, 
that both Matthew and Luke also record this event. John does not. And starting in verse 22, it said, And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, and he drank all of it. And they said to him, this, he said to them, this is my blood of the cup, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. <coughs> Setting the world outside these walls for a moment in time. And focusing on these emblems and what they represent is the most important thing in this moment. Nothing else matters. For this reminds us of just what it took to save our souls. Let us now have the blessing for the great truth. Please pray. Mighty God. We partake of these images on the first day of the week. Remembering the sacrifice of our Lord for what he did for us. We prepare to take the bread that represents his body. We remember. body was taken a crown of thorns pressed into his head I was beaten and whipped I was taken and nailed to a cross the seeking of taking his life great marvelous thing was done. He was lifted up. His body was lifted up. And as we eat this bread, we remember that. And in participating in the eating of this bread, we are lifted up. Thanks to you. And we do this with a joyful heart. Remembering that it was for us he was willing to undergo all of that. We give thanks unto thee, Father, through the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have the blessing for the cup, please. Father in heaven, we continue our prayer this morning as we partake of this cup, this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood Christ shed on the cross for all of us. We pray, Father, as we partake this morning that we would do so in a manner well pleasing unto thee. This prayer we ask is in the name of the loving name of Christ. Amen. Amen.
also commanded on the first day of the week was a command for us to lay by in store. You read the book of Acts chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5. The first century church was very generous, many selling property they had in order to be able to provide for others, the poor, those within the church. And then that spread as Paul took the gospel to the Gentiles. He also further <coughs> gave that command. We read it in 1 Corinthians 16 in verses 1 and 2. But if we also look, we can see in Paul's Philippian letter how the church Philippi supported Paul while he was in prison in Rome. That the churches in those areas, when we read the book of Acts, how they provided for the church in Jerusalem as they were being severely persecuted. We gather together on the first day of the week. We take this moment in time for us to be able to fulfill our obligation in our giving. We decide what that giving will be individually. Not a tenth, not a tithing, but as we purpose in our hearts. That is the important part. Purpose. Not a set amount, but what you choose and decide to do. We have the blessing for it, the contribution for it. Our kind Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to give back a portion of what it has given unto us. May we do this in a manner pleasing unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Seven, six. Seven, six. <clears throat> Bless be the time that binds our hearts in Christian love. The
wonderful, merciful Savior. <clears throat> wonderful, merciful Savior. <laughs> wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and Friend, who would have thought that a Lamb could rescue the souls of men. Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, Comforter, Keeper, Spirit, Glory, 
Do you believe that it is God's will that we stay in a constant state of revival? If we were truthful, we must either be growing or dying, improving or backsliding. There is no middle ground. We cannot just hold our own. The church in Revelation chapter 3 of Laodicea was holding their own. They were lukewarm. Jesus in verse 16 of that chapter said, Because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. What we find in this chapter of Genesis, chapter 11, we see four things from the people of Shinar, the region that they were in. They wanted to, one, build a city. They wanted to build a tower that would reach heaven. They wanted to make a great name for themselves. They wanted to stay together. They did not want to be scattered as God had commanded. The folks here were only four, maybe four or five generations from the flood. All relatives, aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters, moms and dads. And it's understandable why they wanted to stay together. They all spoke the same. They could communicate with one another. They loved each other. The one thing that we have to also understand during this time is there was no modern technology. There were no schools in management. They didn't have a Clemson extension of engineering, no business management classes. But if we look closely to the text, we come to understand that perhaps they could and would pull this off and build the tower. So when we look down in verse 6, as God came down to see what they were doing, he said in verse 6, Behold, they are one people. And they all have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. 
what principles can we find in this account in the Bible that could help us in a modern day revival? You know, it was one thing that God noticed, the very first thing that he noticed, that they were all one. These people were together like this. Paul in Philippians 2 and chapter 2, or chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul said, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in one accord and of one mind. <clears throat> Satan knows that the best way to kill a church is to divide it. And he works 24-7 to drive a wedge of division between us all. And the best defense against division is to be aware that it is possible. Every church that has had division and has split, the people didn't come in one day and said, hey, we're split. This happened over time. And if we are aware of a possibility then we can take the steps to cut it off. And it's not something that we need to be paranoid about. We just need to be aware that it is always possible. You know, the discord, the division, disunity is kind of like dreams and nightmares. You have to feed them to keep them alive. And I'm sure that I can say with all confidence that we do not have to agree on every single thing that comes along. To be honest, Paul and Barnabas were not united when it came to John Mark. Starting their second missionary journey, Paul didn't want John Mark hanging around. So Barnabas left went with John Mark. They were united in purpose. They were willing to be able to continue to take the gospel into a world that was lost. They would eventually get back together. All three. See, they didn't allow the differences to split the church at Antioch. Biblical revival thrives when we all have the same purpose. Now the people of Babel were of one language. I guess you could say probably the secret of the success that they were having was because they could all speak the same language. I dare you to go to a construction site today where everybody can speak the same language. When our bathrooms were being renovated, there was only one guy, John, that I could talk to. All the other guys, all when I would say something to them, all they heard was blah, 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 blah. So we did not speak the same way. Communication is a secret to a successful church. The New Testament concept of this comes from the word kianonia. It means the fellowship, togetherness, having all things in common. When you look at the first few chapters in the book of Acts, you'll see how the church multiplied. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 15, there was 120. In Acts 2 and verse 41, there was 3,000. In Acts chapter 4, verse 4, there was 5,000. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, 
It says basically they multiplied greatly. How did they do this? How did the first century church grow so fast in such a short time? Because they all talked the same talk. They all had the same message. There was no variance between the two. They were constantly in fellowship. They were constantly talking and communicating with one another. And friends, when we all get on the same page, we will see everybody. The other thing that the people of Shinar did in Genesis 11 was they began to do what they set out to do. They didn't talk about it for long. <clears throat> They put their words into action. They were working on their city. They were working on their tower when God came down to see the work on their city and their tower. Now here's what typically happens in your churches today. We make plans. We may go to seminars. We may attend lectureships until we know how to accomplish just about anything we want to accomplish. We never seem to get started. We never put our hands to the plot. One of the most successful efforts in the Old Testament we find in the book of Nehemiah. The rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem. It wasn't going to be an easy task. If we read the second chapter, we see how Nehemiah got up late at night by himself and toured the whole city. That there were times he had to get off his animal in order to get through or go around because the destruction was so great. <clears throat> When he approached the people about rebuilding, they were all for it. You know, there were times where while they were working with one hand, they were holding a weapon in the other. Because there was a lot of people around them that did not want to see this work succeed. But they were determined. And Nehemiah gives us a reason for their success. In chapter 2 and verse 18. Where the people said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. You see, somewhere along the line, we have to put to work the things that we study and learn. Doctrine has to give way to practice. Doers, not just hearers, as James 1, verse 22 tells us. You know, sometimes you'll sit there and the ones who are talking the loudest about doctrine and the soundness, the doctrinal soundness, are the ones who never seem to put their hand to the plow. They rarely search out a place for them to labor for the Lord. Teaching soundness is useless unless it motivates us into action. Revival means that we need to set goals. These people on the plain of Shinar had plans drawn up. They were a goal-setting people. Now, I'm sure every single one of us in here have goals too. Maybe that goal is to get an education. Maybe establishing a career. 
Maybe starting and growing a business. Maybe it's the goal we'd like to retire before we're 40. We all have goals. All of us. But when it comes to the church and our spiritual lives, oftentimes it's like a dog's day something. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. Sadly, that's a sad philosophy for life. And it certainly is not spiritual revival. We want our children who come to our Bible classes to receive the best possible biblical education we can give them. Teachers who strive to build on what hopefully the children are getting at home. Sadly, when we make a plea for teachers, these are the same ones that come back. When Vicki and I first started coming here back in 2007, I remember sitting here, right up here in the upper third pew during the Bible class. We were in a study of James. And an individual had made the comment to Ted, who was teaching the class, that the reason they had gone to another congregation before they came here was because they had no programs here for their kids. Now, I submit to you that the one who made the statement never once volunteered to start a program. And when that same individual, a couple of years later, had wanted to have a class on a certain subject, never offered to teach it. There's times where we have to step up and get forward and move forward together. We can plan all day long. Everything looks good on paper. But the Empire State Building was not built by a piece of paper. The other thing that these people of Shinar had was faith. Not so much faith in God, but faith in themselves. They believed that they could do it. They believed that they could build a tower to heaven. This is a huge undertaking for something that was never, ever done before. Even God said they could do anything that they imagined to do. The only way that the construction of that tower stopped was because God intervened. That whole project was against God's will. God is not against our being a people of revival. He's not against us individually or collectively. For Paul said in Romans 8 verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? This congregation and all the individuals in it can accomplish anything they set their hearts to accomplish as long as it is within God's will. The only limits to our revival are the limits that we set on our own personal faith for lack of. What are some of the personal traits that we need to develop? Especially if we are to have a revival in our own lives or even in the lives of the church. First, we need to steer our sides on Christ. You know, John the Baptist, as we've been studying in John chapter 1 and verse 29, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. You know, John was battling 
in the first part in verse 19 on, the Pharisees and, and the religious leaders wanted to know who John was. John didn't care about who John was. John wanted to share and point them to Christ. He was more interested in Christ than himself. And Jesus said that we must lose our lives to be successful children of God. Not the literal sense. But we need to place our spiritual life above all else. Are our set, sights set on Christ? Or do we still have them focused on ourselves? Second, we must become transparent. Galatians 2 and verse 20, Paul said these very familiar words. It is no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me. You see, when people saw Paul, they saw Christ. But we need to ask us, are we that transparent? When people see us individually, do they see Dennis or do they see Christ? Jesus was transparent. He was God incarnate. And we are to be the second incarnate by letting others see Christ in us. Third, the Bible begins with our curiosity. Again, we go to John chapter 1, verse 38. The man that asked, where are you staying? And Jesus said, come and you will see. Later, that same individual, Andrew, became a disciple began with curiosity. Have you ever attended a congregation where you were afraid to invite your neighbors and friends? Afraid because you were afraid of what they might see or hear? This should never be the case in any congregation, let alone us. We need to invite our neighbors, our, our friends. Let them come and see our love. Come and see our search for the truth. Our friendliness. Seeing Christ being demonstrated in our own lives. When the disciples met Jesus, they, they brought their brothers. The lady at Jacob's well, she went to her friends. She went to to the townsfolk and saying, come, see the cross. The Bible begins with us in here. The desire to be revived each and every day. How many of us here this morning want to start a spiritual revival? Not just in our own lives, but also in the lives of our families, the church. Certainly in our nation. Our nation needs it desperately. I believe every one of us would say yes. And God is giving us the opportunity to do some great things for him. While we use the good examples, the good side of the examples of the people of shine on those good qualities were okay, but they violated God's will and God's command. But let us take those good qualities in the spirit in which they were given this morning to revive ourselves in the spirit of service and work for the Lord. Let us take today to be a beginning of change within our own lives. We can use these principles in our own revival. 
we need to ask ourselves. Have we reached the plateau? Have we become lukewarm? Something needs to happen to get us growing. Not only numerically, but spiritually. Are you here this morning and you want to become a child of God? The invitation is yours this morning. By faith and repentance, confession and baptism, you can be receivers of the promise of a home in heaven. Are you ready to commit yourselves to a personal revival? If you are and you need to make things right with God in order to proceed, we want to give you that opportunity also. If there is anyone that has a need, we pray that you'll come together. We stand and we sing. Bearing with Christ, I blessed Redeemer, enter the old life of folly and sin. Sing to me, call. This evening at 5 for our evening worship and our final ice cream Sunday tonight, the back to school version. So uh, we encourage you to come. I think there'll be some hot dogs and some other things as well. So, and uh, some starter items for students that are going back to school, those that are in this county tomorrow. So uh, we wish them well and hope that they'll be able to withstand the things that go along in the schools. Uh, this Saturday will be ladies' Bible class as well, I believe, so uh, keep that in mind, 10 a.m. for the ladies' Bible class. If we have nothing else at this time, we'll be dismissed with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and the many blessings of life. We just can't thank Thee enough for all that You do for us each and every day. Thankful for the opportunity we've had to come together and worship Thee. 
compared to all that we've said and done here today, we can found believing the league. We can gain most by just simply being here. We pray that you'll continue to be with those that we know of are sick, the folks that are shut in, the ones that may be traveling or working. Just be with these and be with the folks that tend to them. We're thankful for them for their ability and willingness to carry out these duties. Our kids do start back to school tomorrow and we're just praying for them. We do know that things are being pressed upon them that are contrary to your word. We pray that we can continue to insulate them in our homes and here in here at church, we pray that we continue to be that example we need to be to maintain and fend off these things. Be with our teachers as well and our administrators. They have tough jobs as well. We're thankful for the ones that protect us each and every day. It means so much to us. We pray that you be with them and be with their family. Rachel. Be with us now as we prepare to leave this place and just keep us safe until we meet again. We do us the worst thing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.